Are you on now? Okay, great. I think we'll get started. Uh, the last session really took all, all 60 minutes, so uh, we'll try and make it exciting. If not, uh, please don't snore too loud. I'm Mike Yonker, and I'm uh, Vice President and General Manager for uh, the mobile practice at Rockfish. And what we're going to talk about uh, in this session, sort of a little different than the last one, is about uh, tablets and, 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 and sort of the innovations around tablets. And uh, we're going to have three great speakers that I'll introduce uh, at their times. And if there's time permitting, at the end, we'll do a little Q&A. If time's not permitting, then you're that much closer to the Miller time. So um, I wanted to start it out. I, I, there's actually, uh, uh, thanks to the BBC, actually, I'm going to show you a, a lesson about innovation. Uh, and it all centers around the, the 30th anniversary of the iPod, uh, the iPod. And there was a great article in uh, BBC about a, uh, a British gentleman who gave his son, or sorry, the, 30, the 30th anniversary of, whoops, we're in the wrong screen, sorry. We're on the right screen. We're on the wrong right. Ah, let's try it again. Much better. So I'm Mike Yonker. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, it was about the, th the 30th anniversary of the Walkman. And so this uh, British gentleman decided uh, to do a little anthropology test by himself and gave his son a uh, Walkman to replace his iPod for a week. Um, and you can imagine the fun that ensued. Um, he he uh, carried around for a week and he had a couple of interesting observations about uh, using this uh, ancient technology. Uh, a, it was rather cumbersome. I like this one. The weight of the unit is enough to haul down a low-slung pair of combats. Uh, as I boarded the school bus, I was greeted with laughter. I'm sure it was, uh, they were laughing with him, not at him. Uh, the tapes which I, uh, I had could only hold around 12 tracks each, a fraction of the capacity of an iPod. And uh, I love this one the most because I, I know my, my kids will, will be saying the same sort of thing uh, about me one day. Did my dad, Alan, really ever think that this was a credible piece of technology? And I have to say, you know, I'm, I'll probably date, my, uh, date myself here, uh, but when the, when the Walkman came out, it was the shizzle. I mean, it sounded like you had a concert in your ear. It was just, it was amazing. And uh, so it really stabs me in the heart to see this uh, take on uh, something that I, f I find so iconic. But in the end, uh, this, uh, this young man uh, failed his, uh, his test. And he has this to say at the very end of the article. Personally, I'm relieved I live in the digital age with bigger choice, more functions, and smaller devices. I'm relieved that the majority of technological advancement happened before I was born, <laughs> as I can't imagine having to use such basic equipment every day. And I just, when I read it, I was going through the whole article, and I got to that part, and I'm thinking, you know, you, you just pooped your pants here. I mean, you missed the whole point. And if you don't think that your iPod is going to be a turd in 30 years, then you really missed the point of the, the whole experiment. So uh, disenfranchised is, uh, is my theme here. And I, I find that um, more times than not, a lot of what we're doing with tablets is really, you know, and a lot of what we do in general is uh, disenfranchising uh, previous ways uh, that we, we did things. And, um, and I wanted to show a couple of examples of disenfranchisement uh, that uh, intrigued me about tablet usage. So actually, before I do that, there's, um, you know, everybody's got their view about um, technology curves and, and usage adoption and, and uh, Jeffrey Moore with crossing the, the chasm. Um, I actually have a much simpler, and, and, and this is actually, I, I think is a, a really interesting framework that Gartner did uh, to give them uh, uh, credibility. There's a lot of questions I have about, you know, geez, you know, do, what, are mesh networks really that far down the curve? And I'm not really sure about that. But um, it's 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 useful framework, um, but but I have a much simpler test, and my, my simple test is, uh, does my mom actually know what the heck this is? Because um, I had work I've worked in technology and technology related things for over 21 years, and um, for the first 10 years of my life, my mom had no bloody idea what I did, 
and to the point where I don't know what she said to her friends at the bridge, bridge tournament about what I did, and maybe I was a meth dealer or something like that. Um, and so that, that's, for me, it's, it's usually my, my barometer. What is my sister, or my mom, what do they think about this kind of technology? And, and if, if they actually know what it is and they can describe it to their friends, then, then maybe it actually has a chance of being something useful. And uh, I actually went to dinner Tuesday night here in New York with my mom, and she, she said that uh, she doesn't know what she would do without her iPhone or her iPad. And so I think, well, geez, then we've really made it to the big time. So what are, what are some of these crazy examples and, and what, what's actually getting disenfranchised? Uh, the first is actually, it's, this is a, a case study that's up on uh, Apple's website about a, a small re, uh, uh, auto dealer in the Phoenix area who effectively uh, created a holistic experience for their, their uh, auto consumers when they come in uh, to buy new and used cars. And sort of from end to end, uh, they're engaged in the sales process with their salesperson, with the, uh, the tablet, in this case an iPad, and uh, can actually you know, buy the, the car on, on a tablet. And you know, it probably isn't going to make anybody shed a tear, but yes, used car salesmen are being disenfranchised because they actually are able to sell uh, three times as, man as many used cars uh, with, this, uh, uh, with the, uh, the same uh, amount of, of salespeople. So I know everybody's going to be a little uh, teary-eyed after that one. Um, you know, somebody mentioned this in the previous uh, discussion. I think Matt Martin from Sam's Club that cookbooks. And, and I think the interesting thing here isn't it's not just about uh, digital publishing. Much like uh, Christine Cook in the in the previous session, there's interactivity uh, that goes along with the publishing of a book. And in this case, you know, it's not just here's the recipe. You know, it could do everything from interact with your shopping app to uh, enter the ingredients. You know, geez, I, I want this, uh, this recipe. I want to cook this recipe this week. Put these things into my shopping list on my Sam's Club iPad app. Uh, I, uh, I don't really understand uh, this part of, of, of making uh, bread. You know, how do I actually do this? Can I see a video? Can you, like, literally interactively step me through that process so I can keep my hands uh, on the dough. Um, yeah, I guess you, you know, the, in the technology world, they talk about dog fooding. You know, you have to use your own products. In this case, Apple has used uh, iPads as retail signage, and they feel like it, it keeps their uh, salespeople more engaged with uh, customers uh, for other things. They can be more efficient, and they can update the signage a lot quicker and a lot cheaper and reuse a lot of existing assets they have. DVD players. Um, God, I've never bought a Blu-ray player. I don't think I ever will. And, um, you know, advances like Netflix and, and other uh, streaming services are really uh, uh, taking away the need uh, for, for some of these older devices. And my kids expect uh, any content anywhere on any device, any time. Uh, you know, really it's sort of the DVR generation, and, and uh, tab tablets have a big part in that. Handheld gaming. Um, you know, probably a couple years ago, you'd have seen quotes in the in press about different uh, handheld gaming manufacturers uh, swearing that uh, the, I the iPad or the iPhone had no effect on, on what they're doing, but, uh, you know, I think uh, the, the picture probably says it all. I'm, I'm, Sure, some of you are playing Angry Birds right now. <laughs> so, uh, what, what does uh, my crystal tablet tell me? Um, I, I sort of have a, a feeling about this. In the end, you know, mobile and tablet. In, in the end, for a lot of us as marketers and uh, retailers and, and others in, in the in the audience, it, in the end, it is just a channel. And 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 one day, it it too will be a turd and it'll be disenfranchised. Um, and you know, my big lesson over my. Uh, my life in, in technology is that you're not trying to disenfranchise yourself. Somebody else is, so uh, you might as well do it by yourself and, and figure out what your next business is going to be. Uh, smartphones and tablets have disenfranchised so many things, digital cameras, gaming, video recorders, iPods. Uh, and in the immortal words of, of uh, Wayne Gretzky, uh, I skate to where the puck is going and not where it, uh, it's been. So yes, tablets. Uh, two one day will be a dinosaur, uh, and I'm sure that 
there'll be some kid that the BBC will, will interview and he'll look at the, uh, the iPad and think, my God, how could you uh, use that, that uh, old technology? So um, with that, I want to introduce uh, our first uh, speaker, uh, Brandon Berger, who is the Chief uh, Digital Officer uh, for Ogilvy and Mather worldwide. Thanks, Brandon. Let's, uh... I know, it's really great to be the last session of a long week. So I really appreciate everyone for being here. I hope some of you, I know you're waiting to drink. It's okay to drink now, it's fine. If you're drinking now, please pass it around. Um, really appreciate your time. And you know, it, it's funny, my, um, I have a little two and a half year old. And I don't think my two and a half year old would even know how to turn on a button on a Walkman. And, um, but he also doesn't really understand the fact that you've got to use a keyboard with a, with, and a mouse with a, a, a computer. So he, in fact, he, we were looking at the computer the other day, which is a rare thing in my house um, because we typically look at on our iPads, and he has one. Um, and he starts trying to move around on the, on the, mo on the monitor. And I was... And I said, I'm sorry, I know, someday they'll have a better one and it'll be like your iPad. And then he got bored with it and he went back to his iPad. But it's just amazing. It's, it's, kids are expecting this. Um, we'll, 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 the, the idea of a keyboard, the idea of preferred devices to manipulate what you're looking for will change. And so I think that's a really, uh, it's, a, it's a great story and I, and I, and I enjoyed it. Um, so thank you guys. We're gonna, I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about how we look at tablets, right, from a, from, from a marketing perspective and from an agency perspective. We at Ogilvy, we're a global network. We're 18,000 people. We've got 120 countries that we're covered. And we've got a, a mobile practice that crosses all of that spectrum. And so we're constantly thinking about the role of tablets in all of our communication, whether it's a, uh, from B2B or B2C or retail or point of sale or even how it's affecting social and e-commerce and healthcare marketing. And so I thought um, we'd, we'd, we'd talk really quickly just kind of, you know, what's happening in this space. Um, and I, I kind of want to just talk a little bit from a global perspective in our, our view. Because I think really what's, what's most interesting about this is, is what's happening on a global level. Um, I don't know if you guys know about this or have heard about this, but there's a, you know, there's, there's a huge global demand for tablets. I mean, this is 41% this is of all China will purchase a tablet in 12 months. I mean, that's a big deal, right? I don't know if you also have heard that in India, they're going to be manufacturing a $35 tablet. Can you imagine what that's going to do for computing, for access to information, for the society? So it's pretty powerful when you start to think about what's, what's going on in the world and how really these small devices, which I was really hoping to control my presentation on my iPad, but that didn't happen, um, you know, can do. And when they're, they're portable, they're accessible, they're low powered, I mean, it's really going to be changing the way we're going to be interacting with the world. You know, what, another thing that's really happening a lot is entertainment. Entertainment. Two thirds of all tablet users are, are in playing games, like you talked about. And, and these are really, this is a device for entertainment. It's really, you know, it, it, it's, people are expecting that. It's a rich, it's high graphic, it's high touch. Um, as a gamer myself, you know, I sit down and I, and I get really deep in my, my PS3 or whatnot, but when it comes to my tablet, it's a quick, you know, quick experience, it's fun, I can do it anywhere I go. If there was a way to connect the two, it would be perfect. But tablets are really driving a lot of this. Another thing that's happening from a, from a leisure and, and uh, entertainment perspective is the news and content. Three-fifths of all tablet users are, are consuming news and information on their tablets. I mean, this is happening everywhere you are. I mean, they're always, even about 25% of them are doing it on a daily basis. So we're, these devices, as, as you obviously know from the earlier presentation, these devices are great news and information platforms. They're also great commerce platforms. They're, they're, it, what, what's amazing is, I don't, I don't know how many of you, um, how many of you have shopped on your tablet? I, I don't even log on my computer to go to do shopping anymore when I'm, when I'm doing e-commerce, because it's so much faster, I think about what I'm at, I can do it anywhere, and so it's, it's, it's a really powerful device. And so half of owners of all tablets have done this, and so it's a really, it, it's happening everywhere. And you know, it, it's, it's a, true, it's a true global phenomenon that we, that we just can't, we can't underestimate. We have to be constantly thinking about how we're going to use it from a marketing perspective. And so, really, what makes them so special? You know, if you think about it, let, let's just take a step back for a moment, right? Let's, let's talk about where we've been. I mean, this idea of desktops, these were 
clunky. They're big. They sit in your in one place. I mean, if your desktop at home sits probably in like an office, if you don't live in Manhattan, if you do live in Manhattan, it probably sits in your living room. Um, you know, it's it's you, you you have to go to it. You've got to turn it on. You have a clunky mouse. I mean, it's it's even no matter what Steve Jobs has done, it's still you know a very static experience, right? And it's and it's used for much longer. Uh, amounts of time. It's also, it's, it's not very portable. It's really, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty form factored. And then when we start talking about like the mobile, you know, it's been dynamic. It's, it's, it's this central communication device. Every single person in this entire room has one. If you don't, I don't know where you, where, I, I don't even know what I can say about that. Um, it, it's, everybody's got it. They're GPS enabled. They're smart, especially in the states here. We, we have iPhones. We have Androids. We have really smart devices. And we're seeing a lot more smart devices being proliferated across the world. Um, in, in places like Brazil, we're moving away from kind of uh, feature phones to much more of uh, uh, smart devices. And this will be a big driving factor. But these things also have GPS. But they don't have a lot of power, right? They don't make up for that that, that thing you need. I mean, when you go to your computer, you, you need the power. You need, the, you need the, 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 the computing power of the machine. So these iPhones really don't, these, these mobile phones don't really do that. So what's happened is tablets have kind of become that intersection point where the desktop and the mobile phones kind of inter overlap. I mean, they, they're a bit more of a, a, a desktop behavior because they're a bit bigger. I don't, I don't know if you see people walking down the street on their tablet. It's kind of slightly awkward. Um, you know, they're, 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 but their characteristics are all infused with this idea of portability, right? Instant access, connections that are, you know, always wherever you are, right? And, but they're also a lot less expensive. They have a lot longer battery life. They've got a lot better screen quality than mobile phones. And, you know, they've got a higher value in terms of, of, of their perception. So that, that's kind of what's been happening here. And, and with that, consumers are buying these devices as really their core connection devices for the homes. And so for us, when, as we, we as marketers like to think about this, the, this device, we, we think about it in many different ways. The first way we think about it is from a consumer perspective, right? What are consumers doing with this device? And in that way, we're, we're always looking at the data. And I'm just going to really, I, I know that everybody's probably tired, and we're going to just kind of go through this quick, and we've got a few other presenters, but we're, I'm just going to kind of talk about one data point that's really interesting. But there's a ton of data that comes through, tons of it that comes through, come through all the time via these tablets because they're always connected. We're going to talk a little bit about convenience, how these tablets have changed the way we think about computing. We're then we're going to talk about the shopper, because we have to be talking about the shopper for marketers. Um, on the flip side, a little bit on the B2B th um, side, B2B is a really important space where a lot of people aren't thinking about, but it's a huge growth area when it comes to tablets. And so we're going to talk just real briefly on retail, and then specifically on B2B, how does it empower the enterprise? So, purely from a data perspective. Um, time. Time is really interesting, right? The time usage of these devices ultimately lets you begin to think about the content you create and when you're going to be programming it or producing it for the tablet devices, right? So we've got a lot of peak time. So peak usage during the weekdays is around 9 PM. People are home. They're done with their work. They're using their devices casually. They may be sitting on a couch, you know, drinking a glass of wine. But that's my house, and um, and you know, and, and they'll be doing something with it that's a little bit more fun. Maybe they're browsing Facebook, maybe they're shopping, those types of things. You know, it's much more casual. On the weekends, it's a lot of morning time, right? The idea of you know, you're pulling it up, you're maybe reading your Sunday Times on it, you're using it to co consume information. You know, get up to speed, plan the day. Maybe you've got some adventures you're going to try and do. So we are constantly thinking about how can data be used to unlock the content we're creating, right? And ultimately, then how can we then take that data? and optimize it and deliver it. So really thinking about time spent is a great area and one of the key places that we, we look at when it comes to tablets. Convenience. The tablets are a convenient device, right? It's always on. It's open 24 hours. It gives you access to every single thing you need in a very, very rich, deep way all the time. It's so easy to find content. It's so easy to get anything you want. Um, Mike talked briefly a bit about cooking, right? The idea of having your tablet in your kitchen and having access to every single recipe in the world. Every recipe in the world except for maybe somebody's mom's chicken soup. You may not have access to, but they're all there and it's all accessible. And so it's really easy. When you're learning, if you want to play the piano or the guitar, I, I, I'm learning guitar and so I, I pull up my tablet, I've, I sit it down on, 
on my desk and I, and I tried the guitar very ter poorly. Um, when I'm, and I'm downloading content all the time trying to learn that. So it's really, it's a, it's a wonderful and very powerful tool. So we're always thinking about what is, what's the role of convenience and how does that impact the way marketers need to be thinking about this platform. The shopper environment. I mean, let's be honest here. This is vital. So, you know, people are shopping on these devices, right? They're, they're, they're using it more and more. This, is, this device is going to be driving the e-commerce activity much more moving forward. The ability to shop, as all of you have said, where you are, when you are, without having to boot something up, without having to wait for something to connect, you're constantly connected, and it really changes it. And so I saw the uh, raise of hands of people who've done it. It's pretty powerful. And the, and the flip side is retailers really haven't, started, haven't figured out how they're going to monetize this new digital shelf space, which becomes a huge opportunity for, for marketers. You know, what, what, what's that, what is that point that, that connects the brand and the retail, and what's the role of the consumer in that ill experience always on at, at night and nights? And so we're thinking about that all the time. How can, how can retailers get access to this, and how can they connect in a deeper way? Am I, are you guys still with me? Or are you sleeping? <laughs> we're still together, okay. The business environments. Now we'll talk a little bit about the business environments. Um, you know, back to the retail environments. How many people go into any retailer? How many people go into retailers, right? And you walk in, you've been to Best Buy, right? You walk in, you want to get a camera. You want to know about the camera. You don't want to have to ask somebody. You probably know more about it because you've done research. Maybe a TV. You want to find out all this information, right? Well, well you... Imagine if these guys had tablets in their hands and they could give you a full view of all the data specs that you needed without ever having to you know, pause and ask somebody, pull up a thing and go to a computer. That would completely transform how you shop in these environments. And what's, what's really interesting is that a lot of these retail environments are now becoming places where people go to browse and they go home to buy. But I think if, if, if tablets were enabled in these retail environments, not just... Not just Tell, giving you instructions, but really how the sales force could use it, I think it would really change how we think about our retail experiences. So it, it would give staff an edge over that consumer, which they don't have today. You know, I, um, recently Walmart just announced that they, um, they've developed a, a mobile app that connects directly with the in-store experience. So, so retailers are thinking about this, and they're going to be participating in this more and more. The other area we look at it is the B2B perspective, right? You know, this is vital. I don't, a, lot of, a lot of brands, a lot of marketers aren't thinking about the role of B2B and tablets and how that can transform the entire sales process and the, the entire enterprise level, right? How can it change the pitch process? I mean, how many people in here are, are, are ad reps or sales reps? Anybody? Okay. Right? So imagine if you had, you know, if, when you walk in with a tablet and you've got access to the information, you're not booting up a computer, you're not plugging it in, you've got access all the time, right? And so imagine you're, you know, uh, you're, you're selling servers. You could simply walk into a, a client and deliver them all of the things they need at that moment, and it's always on. You've got full access. You're not booting up a computer, you're not plugging it in, you're not waiting for the whole process. It's a pretty powerful tool, right? It's convenient. You can have eye-to-eye -eye contact, right? That's something that always has to happen when you're having a presentation, right? It's consistent. You can deliver all this information all the time. You can, op, op, you can literally go out and ensure that all of your sales reps have the same content in their hands wherever they are. It's pretty powerful, right? It's real time. Anything you need, if, whether you're talking about one of our brands or you're talking, about, you're talking to a doctor, it's, all that information is real time and it's, it's exactly tailored to the conversation you have because you can pull it up as you go. And it's much more productive. It's much more efficient. You can have a central source of data and then you can deploy it out. It really, it really transforms the business. And in fact, I'm going to just give you a quick example right here. Um, let's see if this will go. So we, did a, we recently did um, an app for Johnson & Johnson's sales reps. So this was for a drug called Symphony, it's for, it was for pharma reps. And basically what it does is it allows you, if you can see here, it, we use multi-touch touch gestures to allow our, the reps to pull up exactly what the doctor wants. In this case, you know, th these, these, um, these patients are talking about pain, right? And so they're immediately pulling up specific things that this doctor is most concerned with. He's then able, they're then able to give you the exact content they need 
at that moment, wherever they are, and it's so much faster. They don't have to, you know, they can do it in an elevator, they can do it anywhere they want to do. And then, then here they're also using the device, the, the multi-touch gestures, the, the, the movement of the device, the ability to manipulate it, to also be part of the experience. And so having that data is really going to transform the business. And, and for us, nearly 99% of all the sales reps improved in proficiency in their presentation ability to sell this device, to sell this, uh, this product. So it's, a, you know, it's really changing the way we do business. And I think it's going to keep changing the way we connect with the world. And so that was kind of my quick wham bam tablet perspective. Um, and I don't know what happened here. And uh, and that's it. That's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. you look great. So uh, actually, it's a great tee up when you think about uh, uh, retail sort of sales assistants. I want to introduce Brad Locke, marketing director of Nutro. And uh, let's just make sure we're we're still uh, active here. Uh, it is. Good afternoon. Home stretch, almost there. A little bit longer, and it's Miller time. Um, okay, so hopefully I can entertain you for a few minutes here before before we part ways for the day uh, for a couple reasons. One, I'm going to be talking about pets um, and pet parents for one. So who doesn't love pets? Um, two, uh, I'm going to share some very much in process work. Um, uh, as a company, we're in a turnaround situation, um, kind of coming from a very analog background and. Um, um, so to be experimenting with some of this stuff is, is, is things you wouldn't expect probably for us to do since there's so much foundational work we need to get underway. So we'll unpack that a little bit. But um, the Neutro company is a provider, has been around since, um, since 1926. Um, the original you know, food, pet food company making all natural pet food. And so uh, really have been in the space a very long time and um, a very rich tradition in bringing in the highest quality ingredients, um, understanding uh, the pet physiology better than anyone, and bringing those two things together to formulate natural pet food um, that's the best pet food in the world. And so, um, so uh, but the space is changing dramatically. And, um, and if any of you who have pets shop in pet specialty, you'll know that it's a crazy landscape. Um, as we evolve from where we've been, um, a very in-store centric company, um, very sales oriented, uh, in terms of relationships, it was all about the sales rep's relationship with the independent pet owner. Of course, that was before the big box pet shops opened up. Um, and so it was all around in-store domination, really. Um, in-store recommendation, in-store presence through displays, um, and dominant distribution and presence. And, um, and times have really changed from a retail landscape standpoint, and so is the competitive set. And so um, as we've, as, as kind of the, the new organization has, has been set up, um, so a little history, um, Neutro was acquired by uh, Mars Pet Care a couple years ago. And so um, when I joined after leaving P&G for about 10 years, I'd been here about a year and a half. Two years ago, there was one marketer here. Um, and the amount of data they had was they could tell you how many trucks they were shipping per month. That's how much data they had. <laughs> so imagine how to run a business uh, that's several hundred million dollars off that amount of data. Suffice to say, there wasn't any brand building going on nor any digital planning in place. So, oh, lost it there. So in the last 18 months, um, we're essentially a, um, a big company, but that's in startup mode from an organizational standpoint. And so, um, so it's a very big category, and it's very attractive. So it's a $20 billion category. Pet specialty is about $6.5 billion. Um, and uh, so you can see that as, as you look at the composition of the channel and what's going on, natural is really driving it. Natural, you hear it called holistic. It's about uh, $2.25 and a quarter billion, dollars, and it's, and it's kind of outpacing growth with all the other pet foods. And so very attractive segment you know, in, terms of, uh, in terms of people coming in. The challenging part is there's, there's very little barriers to entry. So if you have an idea for a story you want to have behind a pet food and a few thousand bucks, you can go to a contract manufacturer and start making pet food, okay? And so that's great from an entrepreneurship standpoint. It's terrible um, from, uh, from a shortcut to, to quality nutrition, to food, to food safety control, things like that. And so over the course of this time, you can see where, you know, where we, were, we came in in the 20s and then um, started to really have a strong presence in the 80s. And then as other brands you might recognize started to launch in, in the 90s and 2000s, and then to present, um, you know, about 300 new brands in the last two years 
Um, so, it's, so it's just a hyper-competitive space. Um, because there's very low barriers to entry, there's also been a tremendous amount of product recalls, a lot of safety issues over the last couple years. So the big, the big, uh, the big obviously, recall that affected lots of manufacturers in 2009. Um, as well as a lot of smaller ones since then. And so, um, so in kind of in this context, you know, um, pet parents are, are even more hypersensitive to making sure they've got a quality food and a, and a brand they can trust. Um, it's a complicated story to tell, too, right? Because um, think of it like your baby. You know, I'm, I'm sure many of you who are pet parents think about your pet as a baby. And um, for us, there's a lot that goes into ensuring that you as a pet parent are serving the best nutrition you can. So there's, there's an incredible amount of R&D research that goes into um, understanding pet physiology and what's the difference of a, of a toy or small breed dog versus a large breed. And there's very big differences and there's certain kinds of nutrition they need. Um, we're all about natural ingredients. So the best natural high quality ingredients in the world, whether that be salmon or chicken um, or whole grains or whole brown rice, um, how do you take the, the, the insight about the pet and blend it with, with um, expert understanding on the highest quality ingredients? And then the importance of owning your own plants, and, and, and we own our own plants, so there's a story around us in terms of kind of end-to-end -end control. And so that's a very difficult story to tell in the context of that many brands. Taking PetSmart as an example, which is kind of the Walmart of the pet specialty channel, there's over 62 brands in there. And if you look at how much linear footage that translates into, there's about a half a mile of SKUs half a mile of SKUs in one store. If you go into a grocery store, there's about 150 or 175 feet of SKUs. So compare that a half a mile to that. So if you walk in, if you've never been in one, it's, it's overwhelming and, and there's a lot to accomplish in that short amount of time. And you know, it's just, it's just too much to communicate on packaging, right? Um, and, uh, and we've even got the, the luxury of having the biggest package in the consumer package goods industry to work with. And so, so it's an important that, um, that there's other mechanisms for how we um, communicate and connect with shoppers. And so for us, historically, that has been what, who we call our pet nutrition specialists. And so we've had the unique opportunity over about uh, a couple decades to, to build up a, a pet nutrition specialist force of about 1,300 folks who are part-time um, kind of passionate pet owners who have a certain amount of knowledge about nutrition. And they're actually in the stores on the weekends. So they're not store associates, there are folks who are in the stores on the weekends um, set up to help intercept shoppers when they come in to help them figure out you know, what's, what's the right kind of food for them. Um, it's a very analog though environment. Um, you know, the tools they've had to date um, are, are simple hard copies of things. Um, you know, brochures, using the packaging itself, stuff like that. And, um, and so it's been all about using the, the, the personal relationship that they build. And so what we started to ask ourselves was, um, one, um, consumers are doing a lot more research online, so they're coming in more on autopilot than they were in the past. And two, co as competition has come in, a few of the competitors have copied this very model. And so they'll have people in as well. And so you start to get this commoditized effect going on. So how do we, how do we improve the interaction with the pet parent um, in terms of from an education standpoint and, and also start to differentiate from, uh, from competition? And that's where really the tablet idea came into play. So it was really a concept for there's, you know, there's so much knowledge and information that um, they need to be trained on to set them up to speak with expertise about, about pets and their needs and about nutrition, um, that it requires a lot of training. And if we can give them a way to, one, kind of leapfrog their effectiveness when they're on their learning curve, and, and two, give them access to, to particularly visually stimulating tools in the in-store environment, that that would really start to pay dividends. So, so this is just a, um, kind of the intro page of what it looks like. So I'll kind of walk through a couple of the slides. But it's essentially meant to facilitate a conversation. So this is still about people and somebody making a connection one-on-one -on -one and a dialogue one-on-one. -on -one. And so this is very much not meant to be something that would ever be in the hands of the shopper to self-navigate. This is a support tool, so similar like you, you saw used in the last example. So, um, so when they first start to introduce who we are, most people don't know who we are. And so it gives you some opportunity to talk a little bit about our, our nutrition philosophy, to use video, to use pictures, to show them where the ingredients come from. Um, um, to talk about the role of, of one ingredient versus another and how that translates into specific pet benefits that, they're, uh, that their pet needs. Um, and to also just custom tailor um, the information to that individual shopper. So this, will, this, this part here is, um, is when they first start to interact and start the dialogue about their pet. You know, once they ask their name, you know, then they ask, okay, well, how old is, how old is uh, you know, Fluffy? You know, um, 
you know, what kind of needs do they have, and this is where they can start to pull them in and um, once in a while let them, let them actually touch it themselves. But as you can see here, they can pick, you know, life stage, you know, is this a, is this a puppy, is this a senior dog, um, do they have any special needs or considerations like a sensitive stomach, um, like scratchy fur, things like that. And what will happen is, is that then this chugs out some, some key insights about that particular pet's needs that then allows them to set up a story around what's the right um, SKU recommendation for them, what's the right formula um, for that pet's needs. Um, so then it allows them to just kind of walk through kind of a logical um, story that they'd go through. And the, and the advantage I guess we had here was um, when you've got 1,300 people who have been doing this for a very long time, they know every question that's ever been asked um, 100 times over. Um, what's the sequence of questions? What are the barriers that come up along the way? How do they build over time? So that gave us a ton of knowledge about you know, how can this optimally kind of support them versus, you know, replace them. Um, so then, so, so they can kind of flow through and quickly tab between once they get into detail what um, things around, you know, um, questions that would come up. So things like kibble size and whatnot. And so, um, and then ultimately overcome any final barriers before purchase. So, you know, in this example, um, one of the things that happens if, even if you're sold on it is, hey, how do I, how do I transition? Because I certainly don't want to change and upset my pet's um, stomachs. And so, so having simple things like this to visually kind of take them through, when normally this would all have to be described. So even just in this one slide, um, you can describe this concept in about 30 seconds, but in about five seconds on a visual, um, consumers can understand, okay, it's about mixing and transitioning over time. Um, so, so that's just a little bit of a flavor for, um, for what it's like. And so um, we've only been in test market for 30 days. So, um, um, so you're getting kind of real-time learnings as, as we are right now. Um, so it's kind of in the hands of the folks right now. But the feedback so far has been really encouraging. Um, one, obviously, we've got the qualitative feedback from the, uh, from the users themselves. But there's also a lot of great diagnostic data that's coming in um, from it um, that's allowing us to kind of learn and optimize. So we know we're getting a higher level of engagements with shoppers. Um, which is the most important thing. Um, we're building basket size through not just the, the food purchase, but it's also enabling us to, to, to uh, sell on the add-on purchases, you know, in terms of wet food or snacks and treats and things like that. Um, and it's also just going to enable us to, to um, get a lot better metrics around a very big um, fundamental program um, for the company, which is, uh, which is great. And so, um, um, and kind of lastly, what it's doing is it's, it's just inspiring an overall kind of reinvention of the program itself. So everything from um, who should we be recruiting now? Now that we have a clear point of view on who we are and where we're going, um, what type of people would be the best ambassadors for the brand and store? Um, um, what are they dressed in? That sort of thing. So everything from kind of top to bottom we're looking at. So, um, so just some kind of key takeaways, I guess, on this, which hopefully is a fairly, I think, simple example is, is one, um, you know, I think it all starts with with people and, and first knowing, you know, what are the consumer's needs and wants and desires and worries um, and having a clear understanding of that because that, I think, really answers a lot of the questions for how to apply everything that we're hearing about in, in, uh, in forums like this. Um, the second thing that I think is really important is, is knowing what your brand's purpose is. So not just the functional benefit, but what's the, the why. You know, why does your brand exist? You know, for us, this became clear to us as we were um, tightening our positioning and our, and our reason for being, but it's to, to serve as a, as to step up and be that natural authority in a space that's crowded by, um, um, by shortcut players and to, and to convey that authority and expertise and knowledge on nutrition and be the brand that's educating consumers about what's the, what's the best thing for their pet. And so I think that's an important thing because once you're clear on that, um, you can really start to intersect that with the needs and figure out what role is this going to play. You know, the, um, the other thing I'd say that was kind of a learning for us on this was um, how to use technology not to maybe do completely new things, but to kind of amplify or fortify what are already core competencies. So for us, this program, these nutritionists uh, have always been one of the, the key pillars of how the company went to market. Um, and, and when we thought about how do we make that program better, more effective, um, that's when it started to make sense of what's the role this could play. If that didn't exist we, and the tablet came about, we would have never started with a tablet and said, wow, we should hire all these part-time people to work in the store so they could hold these things. It just wouldn't have, it would have never worked out that way. Um, so I think it's, it's an interesting way just to think about what are you doing really well now and just how can this amplify or strengthen uh, core competencies you have. So, and I guess the last thing is just, you know, there's no risk in testing. Um, so again, you know, for us, um, 
um, we've had very little time to, to spend a lot of time prepping and planning for this. I have one digital manager, and, and she didn't even work on this project because there's other foundational things that, um, that she's having to work on. And so um, there's very little risk in testing. And, uh, and when you test, you kind of have the added benefit of generating excitement um, before the, the big questions like how much does it cost to expand and um, what's going to be the training model? Or how, are we going to lose all these iPads? How are we going to get them back if somebody leaves the company? All the things that kind of the people who want to shut down an idea um, jump on when you first start sharing it with them. So you know, when you test, you kind of take away those, those arrows that they can throw at you. So, so it's a great way to also ease in big ideas um, to an organization. So, so, um, so that's all I have. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. I, I suppose then that dog fooding has a different meaning for, for Nutra. So w with that, uh, our, our last set of speakers, you get two for the price of one here, um, are Joy Robbins, Vice President of Digital Ad Sales for BBC Worldwide Americas, and Case Serkin, Executive Vice President and Global Research Director for Starcom Media Vest Group. Welcome. Let's, uh, do you want to start with the uh, slides? Please. There we go. All right, last presentation oh, on the last day of ad tech. <laughs> We're almost there. Um, just a quick introduction. Um, one of the things about a year after the first iPad came out uh, this past April, we saw a lot of research going on about how people are using tablets, how are they consuming media. But one thing that we really saw missing from a lot of these studies was what's happening with news and what does tablets mean for the future of news, how people consume news, where they consume news, uh, and ultimately how can advertisers actually respectfully insert themselves into the news environment. So we partnered with Starcom Media Vest to really explore that topic. And can you take it, take it from there? Yeah. yeah. So. So I don't want to talk too much about the methodology, but be aware that we did qualitative, quantitative, and then some more qualitative. We wanted to understand what the journey was that people went through um, as they started to use tablets for more of their news consumption. Um, and then at the end, we did something that I'm sure most people in this room would absolutely hate. We deprived people of their tablet for a week and saw what was the impact on them and how did they go back to their old ways. Um, so it's kind of an interesting experiment to do there, fascinating. Um, and the most important things that we learned here, we've just summarized, and we'll take you through each of them in more detail, but these are the big five learnings. Um, as you will all know, you're all sitting here with your tablets now or using them at home, tablets go beyond portability. They're changing our lives in much more unexpected ways, um, and we'll show you some data as we, as we move through the presentation about that. Tablets enhance our appetite for news and our connection with the world. We interviewed a number of different people who didn't really know what the BBC was. They were um, Americans, they used a lot of other American news apps, and one of them said to me, uh, wouldn't it, it's great, I love it, I love learning about all the things that are happening around the world, but why don't they have baseball on it? <laughs> um, don't lecture me, let me control my own news journey. Lots and lots of feedback from um, respondents who were using tablets and, and frustrated by the traditional linear way that we watch news on television. Why do I have to wait 20 minutes to get to the piece that I'm really interested in, whether it be the sport or the weather? And why do you keep telling me about it and then making me hang on through another ad break? So people wanted to just explore news in their own, um, in their own way and get to the, the stories they wanted first. The early bird catches the worm when it comes to news apps. People like to go to the familiar. They build routines around the kind of news and the, the applications and the content that they want to, to, to access every day. And then as it comes to advertising, the piece that I'm really interested in, um, users welcome tablet ads only if they're good. They've got to um, replicate the experience that somebody's in when they're in that application. So if we think about some of the news apps, they've got to offer good video, a very immersive experience, a way to control your own pace to go through it. Um, and that excited me because it made me um, have more confidence in going to my clients to actually ask them for money to start to developing the rich creative that's needed to put into this rich, beautiful environment that the tablet can provide. Just sticking a banner there and, and not much behind it is not really going to work. Um, so, so some data. We won't spend too long on, on these data things. I know you've been immersed in, in presentations all day and, and most of the week. Um, here what we can see is as people use their tablets more, as they've had them for longer, they get more and more excited and find they're using them for more and more things, more inside the home, more outside the home, um, more uh, of the either entertainment or information or the utility tasks that they have to do. 
and we just expect that to continue. So they buy them because it's a kind of a cool thing, but once they get them, then they really start to, to take advantage of the use, as does the environment that, that exists to help that use. So more and more apps are, are available now than when they certainly bought those. I'm going to play a quick video now, if um, I can figure out this. <laughs> You got it. One more click. That really does speak to, I think, some of the lessons that we learned from the research. Oops, actually. Let's uh, put this back in. Yeah. And these were all um, high quality news users. They'd used a mixture of, of US and international use uh, news services, either television, newspapers, or um, websites. Is up now? Okay, we won't go to full screen then. Let's. How's that? What's that? Uh, huh. But you could just listen to it then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the yeah, the sound we should get. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> it's rascally. This is ad tech, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's great. How about now? Can you hear me now? Exactly. I got a better yeah? idea. Okay. How about that? Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> more news, which I didn't know was possible because I get it everywhere else, like wherever I'm in the car I'm getting news, if I'm like at home I'm getting news, even if I'm working. I think I'm reading more variety of news, um, like articles that I probably wouldn't have thought of, I would read, um, whether it be, you know, stuff that's happening halfway across the world. It shows like the whole world and you can pick where you want to go. It almost made me feel like a special agent, like 007, like, oh, you get the access to the world over, do I need to find out what's going on? I never really cared for it, but like this week actually had me more involved in it, and I guess maybe it was something that touched home, so maybe that's why I was more interested, or maybe it was the applications just really feeding me all this information, but it just had me kept following it and following it, so. The app makes it a lot more fun. It's more innovative. You know, the articles are more colorful. I think. I think it's more about images too. Reading it on a tablet app is much more lifelike. Everything comes to life more. It seems more realistic. The graphics are really good. It almost feels like you're you're within the story with with an iPad. Like you get much more deeper. I think it's, it's very personal. You hold it like a book. You hold it like a newspaper, rather than it just being a screen that you're watching. I'm so used to using my app and having it 24 hours a day and getting on it whenever I want. So not being able to use it for a couple days was like, oh my gosh, I did it, but it was hard. I guess I'd say I didn't really know about the news for like a week because I barely like, I'd see it on my phone, the Twitter thing, but I wouldn't want to click it because I wouldn't even see the exact news that I want. If I use the tablet apps, I have the news whenever I want to read it. Uh, and I don't have to, there's no waiting or having to hear another story first. I can read what I want to first and go down from there. You are in control of what news 
you are listening to or reading. The advertisements on my laptop just drive me nuts. Um, it just drives me crazy, and so on the tablet I didn't have that experience, so that was really nice. There's so much more news and ads on the computer, it's harder to stay focused on the story you're reading. But if you make the ad like a part of the app as opposed to just a, a code that you put into it just to make an ad pop up, it make it a lot better than that would be a cool idea. That's really awesome. There was an ad right on the top and it started reading, you left something in the hotel room on your last trip and I was trying to figure out what they were talking about. So that actually kept me keep reading and ended up being um, American Express advertising a new car that gives you um, really good points for traveling. Not only was the ad appropriate to the story I was reading, but it also did something to draw me in and read everything it had to say as opposed to not even noticing it and passing it. Ads on tablets should be as fun as it is to use a tablet. But if there's something fun that I can do with an ad to personalize it and make it really fit on me, then that's something that I might click on and I might send it to my friends. And I think people who do have a lot of curiosity would jump right on. I mean, it's, 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 it's actually pretty cool. So if they can make it, you know, innovative um, and make you broaden your experience even with your iPad, they'll stick a little bit more. Yeah, I talk to my friends about the news a lot now, just because, and I think I've got like a new friend group now, like a more, I guess, intellectual friend group because they're talking about news as well. And I've never read the news really, like the way I did this week, and I was actually really interested. And it looks like I'll probably be reading the news more often now, but I don't know, I just found myself a, a little more interesting. <laughs> I have more things to talk about. All right, so good news for news providers. Um, I think, you know, from the presentation, you can see that tablets are making news more digestible, and it's creating a more enjoyable user experience and leading people to consume more news. So from our study, we saw that people are not only following more news stories with their tablets, but they're following a greater variety of news categories. Yeah. All right. So when and where are they using their tablets for news? Users reported spending 59 minutes at home, um, far more engaging at home at dinner time uh, than uh, at work or at their lunch time. Um, I think it's so very consistent with what we see in our own news app, uh, where we see the highest peak, like what Brandon said, you know, after dinner, at nighttime, um, or on the weekends. Um, so. How are they using news apps? We really wanted to drill down to discoverability and usability after that. So we saw nearly 60% had three or more uh, apps downloaded, um, and about a third of them had seven or more. But an overwhelming majority really only used one to three news apps. Um, and really, they found them in the app store. They stuck with what they found familiar. Um, very rarely were they really persuaded to download apps as a result of advertising. So it was really important that you know, people trust the news. Um, and we really see them that they have to really trust what they're reading. They're relying less on news aggregators. So tablets are making knowing and trusting news providers an even more important thing on tablets. Um, so they're really curating their own news. Um, and with that, I will turn this back to Kate to talk about advertising. Because at the end of the day, if we don't figure out the advertising model, we're not going to have all this rich, great content on our tablets. So I think that's something we all want to sort out. Um, so, as I mentioned before, users do welcome tablet ads that do offer interactivity, immersion, choice, relevance, and partnership. Um, I, I'm not going to take you through all of these different um, pieces of, of data here, but be aware that we did test a number of different ads from um, technology companies and car companies, ideal uh, types of categories for rich, deep information in a highly visual, immersive environment. Um, if you think about moving the brochure and the sales guy into the tablet, these, the, the ads that these guys did did a great job of doing that. 
I know if I could have bought my car on a tablet, I've just bought one recently, I would have done it in a second instead of the months of agony that were drawn out with doing research and um, going to the local dealers. So, you know, you can go back and look at this online afterwards. This takes you through what were the things about those ads that really did drive um, receptivity and engagement from the users. Um, this is one that we tested as well, where uh, we tried to incorporate new technology to show somebody how to personalize, this, in this case, a luxury watch, onto their arm. They could put their hand in if they had the, photo, the camera on the tablet and see how it looked. Uh, this is an iPhone app, but we also tested it on the tablet. And everybody loved it. So think about exploring this kind of interactivity with many different uh, categories that could be personalized. Um, users wanted to have the, the ads and the commercialization not interrupt their news experience. They wanted to just be able to go to it when, when it was relevant for them, when they had a break in the news, when they um, were inspired by the headline on it. Um, so they wanted to see photographs in that. They wanted it to be relevant to the news story. They wanted small ads that they could click on, not something that was just in their face as they were reading the news. Um, they wanted video ads that could be skipped after a few seconds if they found it wasn't something that was really uh, appealing to them, and see a list of ads to choose from as well. Um, banner and background ads were the most popular on both mobile websites and news apps, so there's some degree of content and creative work that can be used across the, the digital environment, but much of it needs to be specific to the device. Um, and Joy mentioned earlier that trust is obviously something that's really important as we think about you know, consumption of news around the world, <laughs> and to have it come from a place that that's, is very trustworthy instead of all the news aggregators. I think we certainly found from our respondents that that was something that was going to help them spend a lot of time and engage really with the news and go off and explore more things within the application than just reading, you know, reams and reams of, of headline newses. And we finished ahead of time, so I think that's a good thing to do on a Thursday at the end of um, a heavy conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you Joy. Thank you. Excellent. And I guess if you. Uh, ever try and deprive my, my mom of her iPad, she'll fight you. She'll really fight you. Hey, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to speakers, uh, Joy, Kate, Brad, and Brandon. And uh, I guess come back to Ad Tech next year. Take care.